cucumbers seem to be a hot topic today. So uh, Manan, we're gonna address those first. Um, in your uh, presentation, uh, we talked about the rainfall patterns and intensity. Um, how do you think this can affect the decision-making uh, regarding produce harvest and hence mitigation disease transfer? <clears throat> um, this kind of parallels how we deal with uh, harvesting uh, oysters and, and so forth here in the Northwest on the coast. They actually are able to do some rainfall simulation or rainfall uh, predictions and then how those might impact uh, levels of bacteria in the, the growing areas along the coast and therefore they'll maybe limit the uh, harvest of, of uh, shellfish. Do you, is there anything like that going on with produce or do you see that maybe possibly happening? Um, so thanks for the question. Uh, I don't, you know, first there's no specific standard or proposed rule that I'm aware of that says, you know, that prevents you from harvesting after, after rainfall or, or anything like that. But um, as Michelle J. Russell mentioned in, in her talk, um, you know, I do think that we, we commonly see that rainfall does affect our ability to recover organisms, either from soil or, or from the actual commodity. So, you know, and I think I saw another question in the chat about um, the rainfall. You know, when we harvested cucumbers right close to rainfall events, you know, right after that, we definitely saw cucumbers that had more E. coli on them. So I would say, you know, if your crop is ready for harvest and you have used a biological, specifically an untreated biological soil amendment, um, you know, a raw manure, um, I would definitely take a little more practice, a little more care in harvesting those. Um, you know, and I don't know what your commodity is. And, you know, some commodities get harvested and left to dry or, um, you know, something like that. But I do think it's a factor. I don't think there's a specific regulation addressing it. And I do think there are other people like Michelle J. Russell and some of our other colleagues who are um, keenly investigating this. Any comments, Michelle? Yeah, it's, um, you know, with our work, it's been, uh, you know, very crop and, and region specific. Uh, so for example, when we had transfer, I mentioned we had transfer to spinach and, and carrots, um, and there, there was a relationship to uh, heavy rainfall and also persistence in soil longer with, with rainfall, but those, uh, that all happened with winter crops in Northern California. Whereas uh, with our romaine lettuce and uh, leafy greens, uh, most of our production is in the desert, the central coast during a time when it's completely dry and there's no rain or, or runoff. Um, we do have overhead sprinkling. So it gets pretty complex to try to, you know, one of the things that I've talked to growers that like the NOP 120, 90 days, it gives you something to do. And, you know, um, it's much harder when you start breaking it down to each crop and each region and, uh, you know, so many different variables. Um, but, you know, that's why <laughs> part of my title was, you know, the case for composting um, where that where that is possible. There, there was a question in the chat box. I don't, I'm maybe getting too far ahead, but it's, a, you know, compost is not sterile and, and treated manures or, or, you know, treated products can get re recontaminated. So um, it's, it's not a, the, the uh, you know, there's, there's, all, there's always things to think about. Um, nothing's a total silver bullet. Okay. So another question coming in, um, and again, I'll pose this to all three of you. If you applied raw poultry manure to a raised vegetable garden, and you did that in late February, what, if anything, can you do to make leafy greens and summer vegetables safe to eat? And they gave an example, would you use a bleach water solution to wash the produce to make it safe to consume? I can start that one. Um, no, <laughs> no, I would not use any bleach or chemicals in, the, in your field. We had a situation that was similar to this um, up in uh, Mendocino County on the, on the North Coast um, where uh, th this was a very large home garden. It was big enough to be, um, you know, have a roadside stand and, uh, you know, vegetables, fruit trees, 
and they had um, a, a horse facility, uh, actually draft horses, huge manure piles, horse manure piles that were semi-aged and they, were, they would routinely uh, apply the manure, including while the crop was in the ground. And the, horse, a horse, the horses had an outbreak of salmonellosis and uh, the outbreak strain transferred into the soil of their garden. And um, when we went and were able to do a, a, a small investigation with them, uh, their hands were cracked from using so much bleach um, and high concentrations. And it's just <laughs> not a good idea. What, what we ended up doing because the soil um, stayed positive for several months, um, be, uh, because it was a, a pretty virulent salmonella strain, uh, they ended up waiting a whole year to put in sensitive crops uh, and, and put in crops they could, they could cook. Um, but other, uh, you know, when you don't have a situation like an outbreak, uh, I've been, uh, Trevor Suslow has told me that cover crops will help reduce pathogens. And so, you know, uh, when, if you can do a, a spring cover crop, I don't know your planting cycle, but, and again, you know, you've got these wait periods. So if you applied in February, and you're not harvesting until um, summer, you, you it might be fine. If you're really nervous, if you have somebody who's especially susceptible, a young child or someone uh, that's on uh, cancer therapy, then, then maybe you know um, they would want to avoid raw vegetables uh, from that field uh, to let it clear out after generally 12 months is plenty long. Uh, um, my printer was going off, so I'm sorry I missed part of your um, answer, but did you talk about removing outer leaves from leafy green crops as well? No, I did not. So if, if you're growing a leafy green crop, um, if it's, you know, especially like iceberg lettuce or something that you can remove the outer leaves, that's also a good precaution to do. With romaine, it's a little more tricky if you're, depending on how you're irrigating the, the romaine, but if you're irrigating the romaine, you know, through the soil, you could probably remove the outer leaves of the romaine lettuce head too, and that's something. It's not, nothing is foolproof, obviously, but those are good steps to take. Yeah, and definitely we've seen crops that are growing off the ground, like steak tomatoes. It's really rare, even with heavy inoculums um, with our, in our amendments of raw manure, we, we don't get easy transfer, even with overhead irrigation, so it's, it's Kind of, you know, think about what crop and, and uh, that you're going to put in that soil if, if you have, if you're concerned and want more than, than the wait period between February and summer. Okay, um, there was at least one, maybe two questions related to applying the BSAOs, um, so the, the, you know, these amendments to soil. And if, if they're fairly clean, uh, they've gone through good composting and so forth, but can they serve as a, um, source of nutrients, or um, I guess that'd be the best way to describe it, for pathogens that are in the soil to actually subsequent, subsequently grow. So in other words, after you've applied the soil amendment, then do you get growth of some of these pathogens that were inherently there in the soil? Um, I can take that one first. So that's a really good question, first of all, and that's something that we're, we're interested in. Um, we do know that the nutrients, say like in um, heat-treated poultry pellets, um, can support growth under the right conditions of, of salmonella. We've done experiments where we've simulated um, heat-treated poultry pellet mixed with soil and sort of created a artificial runoff. And we've seen salmonella be able to grow in that better than it would grow in just say soil that didn't have that. So that's true, but um, you also have to, um, all those nutrients, all the other beneficial bacteria, the non-pathogenic bacteria can also grow in that same matrix as well. Um, we are interested in seeing if that re, what you would call that growth, that regrowth is possible in the field. There's so much microbial competition for bacteria like Salmonella and E. coli and even Listeria. These aren't what we would call their best um, these aren't optimal conditions for them to survive. As Michelle mentioned, they like to be in the gastrointestinal tract of animals where it's warm, there's a lot of available nutrients. So they're sort of playing, you know, in a, in a way game essentially. Um, but it is something that we're looking into. Um, I think it is possible what the extent of that is, I'm, I'm not quite sure, but it's definitely a really good question. And uh, Michelle and I are actually involved in another project 
um, where we're discussing on how to basically best simulate some of those types of scenarios and what's the best realistic scenario that we can actually simulate to investigate that. Yeah, the other, um, uh, working with our California Department of Food and Agriculture that uh, licenses the, um, our, our fertilizers, including uh, some of these heat-treated poultry pellets and, and, and other uh, products that make nutrient claims. Um, you know, when I first uh, heard about the heat-treated poultry pellets, I just kind of assumed they were um, pellet, went through a pelletizer, but sometimes they've they could actually add in um, carbohydrates. Um, there's fish emulsions where they're, they're um, adding in carbohydrates and, and other biostimulants that have um, molasses components. And that's kind of a, you know, that suddenly makes it a little more like a cow gut to be putting in uh, food that, uh, uh, that E. coli or salmonella would be able to uh, persist longer on, or even even grow. So we're, there's nothing out yet from the science that would suggest not to use these, but um, it is something being looked at. And I will add really quickly too. We did do a project in maybe like seven or eight years ago where we took commercial composts um, that were finished, had been certified um, uh, by the U.S. Composting Council, and we did inoculate them. Basically, put E. coli 015787 or salmonella in these finished composts to see if they could regrow. And, and it was just very compost specific. There wasn't like a specific trend that we observed. Um, and the thing that predicted uh, the potential for the populations to increase was, was the moisture content. It was a whole, it was a complex analysis um, for such a simple experiment, but it was basically just very compost dependent. Um, and just because the populations increased, you know, over 24 hours, in some cases we saw them decrease just as fast. So um, it is very um, amendment specific, I will say, for the ability to regrow. Um, but that study was done just in the compost and not mixed in soil or any other sort of field type scenario. Okay, so I'm, we're going to take one more question because we've just gone past the hour, but um, really good questions here, good discussion. Um, so uh, with regard to where the pathogen might be found on the, on the, the crop, um, this question of whether it's on the outside or whether it's inside, uh, for instance, they gave examples of cucumbers or melons. So we're actually seeing this inside the, 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 um, the food of, of interest. Michelle, you want to go first on that one? Or? Well, they brought up cucumber. I'll, I'll go in terms of leafy greens. Um, they, you know, what can happen is that uh, uh, the bacteria, especially uh, there's been research on, on E. coli 0157 in particular, that um, it can actually attach uh, to the uh, stomata, like the pores in the, of the lettuce leaves. And uh, that means that triple washing and all, all the consumer messaging, um, it, it, you know, it may not be enough. It's it's not a kill step, and and the wash water is not a kill step. So that is a concern and a reason that the funnel shape and the and the, the nature of the leaves in a romaine lettuce head um, probably contributes that, and the fact that that's the most popular lettuce people are eating that, you know, but in terms of for leafy greens, there's, it's, there's really no evidence of like root uptake or, or internal, you know, into the inside of a leafy green that that may be different for some of these other crops like um, cucumbers and uh, tomatoes. Yeah, um, I agree with Michelle about the root uptake question. I think like that's really, really unlikely. We've done David Ingram, who was on this call and I did work together a while ago showing that that's really, really unlikely when crops are grown in soil. Um, through, for cantaloupes and cucumbers, um, again, it's unlikely through the root. However, the, the FDA in collaboration with North Carolina State, they did this study where they would take the blossom end of cucumbers um, and inoculate the blossom end. And what would happen, they would inoculate it with salmonella. So put the salmonella right at the blossom and they would be able to find the salmonella survive and persist 
um, in the plant. Now, that's different than being on the fruit and getting into the fruit, but it did get into the plant. Um, now, scientists, we all have different opinions on how to do things. Uh, you know, they, they were using a very high level of salmonella, in my opinion, something that you may, you are unlikely to deal with in a, in a field circumstance, but it did show that it could happen if you had that amount. Um, and as far as melons go, I think, um, you know, melons can either get put through a dump tank or they can be harvested in the field and just packed, you know, straight into the box and then, and then cool it down. For the melons that go in a dump tank, there's always a concern anytime you put tomatoes, melons, anything in, into a dump tank of water. If you have a large enough temperature differential between the, the water temperature and the fruit, um, you can basically suck bacteria and lots of other things in, into the fruit. Um, and I think there's always that concern. So I think the rule is, if Dave Ingram still on this call, you can pipe in, but I think you're not supposed to have more than a 10 degree difference between the fruit and the, and the dump tank water um, when you're doing that. But as far as like what we call pre-harvest in the field, I think it's unlikely that it's internalizing um, into the plant either through the roots or, or through the fruit. And it's just getting subsurface, like Michelle said, um, sort of stomata and just sort of, just very shallow sort of um, at the leaf or fruit surface. Okay, thank you. That's well, another gonna... reason to discard those outer romaine lettuce leaves because the splash and, you know, it's more likely the outer leaves would, would get contaminated. 